The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Before we begin with the afternoon schedule, I do want to also uh, mention there are several cases that are being submitted today without oral argument. State of Iowa versus Patrick Bracey. State of Iowa versus Alan Cotula. State of Iowa versus Hurlbut. And in re the interest of DM. Those four cases are hereby submitted without oral argument. This afternoon we have two different cases and we will start with the case of Calcaterra versus Iowa Board of Medicine. Ms. Dixit, you are first. May it please the court, opposing counsel. Good afternoon. My name is Anagha Dixit and I represent the Iowa Board of Medicine. This is a case that has a very narrow legal question but with broad, far-reaching implications to professional licensure. This case originally arose from a petition for a declaratory order filed by the appellee. The board initially declined to issue such a DO, but the district court ordered the board to file such a DO, and in doing so, the Board of Medicine provided its justification for including limited investigatory information and in its public statements of charges and notices of hearing. The district court on appeal found that although statements of charges and press releases are considered public record, that no investigative information could be included in those documents. Before we proceed to the narrow question of whether or not investigative information can be included in those public records, we have to ask ourselves what the procedure is to even get to the stage of a statement of charges. Now the appellee would have you believe that once a board receives a complaint, the board then immediately files this type of public discipline. This is completely incorrect. When a board receives a complaint, it thoroughly and fully investigates that complaint. An investigator is assigned to the case, witnesses are interviewed, documents are obtained through subpoena or other processes, and the licensee has an opportunity to respond to the allegations in that complaint. This process can sometimes take- So let's, let's assume that the board attached to a statement of charges its investigative file as an addendum or an attachment. Would that be permissible? No, Your Honor, it would not. And why is that? What the law requires under 17A12 is a short and plain statement of the matters asserted. So what's the statutory basis for revealing a lesser amount of investigative information? Absolutely, Your Honor. 17A12, 17A18, 148.7, along with administrative code and the basic functions of Chapter 22 of the Open Records require the Board of Medicine to include limited factual allegations in their public records of notices of hearing. Although 272C6 does prohibit disclosure of that investigative material, it cannot be read in a vacuum. It must be read together in conjunction with those other statutes that I just listed. That 272C.6, do you think that operates solely to protect the patient and the public? No, it does not. It operates jointly to protect the licensee, to protect the patient, and to provide information to the public, as well as protecting a complainant. A complainant can be different than a, than a patient. Its, its primary purpose is to encourage complainants to come forward with information that they won't get punished for because it isn't open to the public. Ms. Dixit, let me go through. You mentioned some other things that you think require uh, this limited investigative information be made public. All right, so starting with 17A12, which is one of them, that just requires a short and plain statement of the matters asserted. It would seem to me that you could do that, uh, at least at least the, you could give the, the uh, respondent notice without making the investigative information public. What is it in there that requires that the actual short and plain statement, that full statement be made public? 
Well, Your Honor, it's, the, it's not the fact that something explicitly says the short and plain statement must be public. It's that nothing says it must be confidential. Other Open than the statute we're talking about, though, right? I mean, don't you need, that statute expressly says, uh, 272C6 expressly says, all investigative information is privileged and confidential. So it seems to me you need something specific to override that in order to get to your destination, which is that some investigative information is public, right? Yes, Your Honor. So if we take Chapter 22, which has the delineation of, in, of, of uh, everything that a government creates, it, there's a presumption that it is an open record unless it is carved out as confidential. Nothing in 272C6 states that a notice of hearing should be considered confidential. We well, know that if why, the why is the public record part of it relevant? Just because the paper, the document itself has to be public doesn't preclude the state from redacting information that's otherwise confidential and privileged and that's done all the time with a w wide variety of public records. So I, I guess I don't see the connection between those two. In, in the instances that is done in other documents, it is because something in Chapter 22 prevents the disclosure of that information. Without the statute... But, but here, the other statute does, 272. It says it shall be confidential, privileged, and confidential. So you have additional statutory authority for redacting information in a public record. It's done all the time. I guess I don't see the connection. Your Honor, for that, we have to look at the purpose behind the open record statute. It's, it is not only to protect a licensee. It is not only to provide that information to the licensee. It is also to put the public on notice. If you compare this to something like a criminal case in which a statute specifically states that minutes of testimony are considered confidential, but limited information from minutes of testimony are included in a criminal complaint. That's because the public deserves to be on notice about what the context of these allegations are. Nothing carves out a notice of hearing as a confidential document. What 17A12 12 tells us is that there are specific things that must be included in that public document. And as part of that, it is not only the jurisdictional statement, it is not only the rules and statutes that we rely on, it has to be a plain and short statement of the matters asserted. 17A18 tells us that we have an obligation to provide the factual allegations to the licensee. So well, I, I, I must say I'm, I'm a little confused, and I want to go back to the, the statute uh, 272C64, and it expressly states that investigative information is confidential, and then there's language about what is investigative information. It says all complaint files, investigative files, and other investigative reports, all complaint files. Just focusing on that statute, doesn't that mean, I mean, isn't, is the complaint part of the complaint file? One would think it would be. Uh, how do you start a file? You start a, I mean, you can imagine the manila file, the old days, you know, the manila file. But with a complaint is, is part of the complaint file. And if so, um, isn't that confidential under the statute? Your Honor, we wouldn't attach the actual complaint files or the actual investigation files to the statement of charges. What's contained in the statement of charges it would, is what provides context to the, the, the rule that we've chosen to discipline this doctor under or that we're proceeding with that disciplinary action. Imagine, if you will, if a doctor receives multiple complaints for wrong site surgery, for negligence and care, for a misdiagnosis or a failure to diagnose. Now, the Board of Medicine will investigate all of the complaints, but in closed session, with the, which the licensee is not entitled to hear or read, the, in closed session, the Board determines that there's only probable cause to proceed with the wrong site surgery. All of those complaints are considered professional competency. If all we put in our notice of hearing slash statement of charges is that there was a professional competency issue, the licensee is not aware of what he or she has to defend himself against. But the counsel, can't they sort that out in discovery in this case? I mean, Although they could. They will learn it, right? I'm sorry, could you repeat they, that? I mean, they, they, they will get to know it, right? 
Absolutely, Your Honor, but the board fails to meet its obligations of due process in providing that information in the notice of hearing. Without that context, the licensee has no way of knowing in a plain and short statement what the matters asserted are. They have no way of knowing in that initial document what the factual, basic factual allegations are. And without that, the Board of Medicine can't meet its statutory obligations. Now, the only appellate court that has looked at this exact same question is the Court of Appeals in Revis, and it reached the same decision that the board's interpretation took, which was that when read in conjunction, when read together, 272C6 paired with the obligations under 17A, with the obligations under 148.7, with the obligations under the open records laws, limited investigative information could be contained in that public document. Well, let's assume all of that's true. I guess I'm still struggling with this concept. If your argument is notice to the licensee, why can't a complaint or statement of charges be drafted with sufficient detail to provide notice and to the extent the board wants to make it public or put it on its website, just redact the confidential information. Why, why is that not a possibility? Because it isn't only the licensee that we're trying to inform. The basic obligation of the Board of Medicine is to protect the public's health and welfare. In doing so, we need to provide some basic context to the public as well. With well then that in that case, take it to hearing and win your hearing. Yes, Your Honor. Final decisions are public record. That is not in contest, context. However, uh, without that basic factual allegations in the statement of charges, there is a prevention of the public being put on notice about what this case is about. There's a prevention of potential witnesses coming forward. And what we know is at a presumption level, at the very basic level, every contested case hearing is in open session. A licensee has to elect to have it in closed session, which means that there is an assumption that some investigative material is open to the public, regardless of what 272C64 says. So if you look at the statement of charges in this case, uh, page three, subsection C, why, why aren't counts one and two sufficiently detailed to give the public notice of what these charges are about without having to reveal confidential information? It explains to the public that this licensee may have been engaged in disruptive behavior, et cetera, et cetera. And then everything else that reveals confidential information is redacted. I, I, I mean, that seems a pretty clear statement of what's at issue. The public can understand this doctor has been accused of unprofessional conduct, right? Yes, Your Honor. Although without any kind of factual allegation, there could be multiple instances of him, him having been, um, of him having disturbed his coworkers or acted in a professionally, uh, in an unprofessional manner. And without any context, the licensee may not know which which aspect of the investigation he has to defend against and potential witnesses to one or the other or the third instance of uh, unprofessionalism in the workplace may not be able to come forward with information. But my only point is that you can just redact it. You can put it in the rest of the document. And then redact everything that the statute says has to be confidential and privileged until such time, as Justice Mansfield said, the board took it to hearing and proved its case, right? I have two responses to that, Your okay. Honor. The first is that the board is considered a governmental body and its documents and records are public records for the purposes of open records laws. So public records may be examined, copied, published, or otherwise disseminated, which is found in the Revis opinion. As to that, I mean, we've got cases, including I think one I wrote last year that say that this general proposition in chapter 22 about public records is trumped by other specific provisions elsewhere in the code that require confidentiality, which is what you have here. I mean, you know, technically everything the Department of Revenue has is a public record, but that doesn't mean that, it, that there's access to it, right? 
Absolutely, Your Honor. But the purpose of, of not producing the entire investigative file is to meet the needs of 272C6 sub 4. However, if you look at 272C6 sub 1, it states that a contested case hearing is open to the public, as does 17A12 sub 7. A contested case hearing is open to the public, which means that the public is entitled to that information unless a licensee elects to hold it enclosed. And I'll bet that normally happens. Wouldn't it be very common for that to be closed to protect that? It happens, but it it has also happened that hearings are held in open session, Your Honor. Do you think um, the provision in uh, 272C.6 that those things are confidential until a final written decision and finding a fact are issued. I would assume that's in case the board is wrong on certain issues or, or to, to protect the physician. Would that be correct? It is to protect the physician. It is to protect the complainant. It is to protect the patients that are, that are spoken of. Obviously, those things are redacted even from the final decision. But yes, the final decision is public because... Again, the public is entitled to know the resolution of the administrative cases that after happen. due process, and there's been an opportunity for a hearing. But, but before due process mm -hmm. is the juncture we're talking about, correct? The entire process is part of the due process. So issuing that statement of charges is part of the due process, including basic investigative. I see that my time has expired. I apologize. May I briefly conclude? Yes, you may briefly. Thank you, Your Honor. It is for. When read in conjunction, the statutes taken together require the Board of Medicine to include limited investigative information in their statements of charges. And for those reasons, we ask you to reverse the decision of the district court. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nelson? May it please the court and counsel. Um, my name is, uh, I'm attorney Trent Nelson. And along with uh, attorney Michael Sellers and Jefferson Fink, we represent uh, Dr. Domenico Calcaterra. I want to tell you a little bit about the, the facts in this case. It starts in 2010. I thought you don't want to tell us about the facts in this case. Uh, no, uh, the facts as far as the procedural facts. How about that? <laughs> the procedural facts. Good point. Um, well, this all started in 2010. My client was uh, uh, overseeing a surgery of a junior uh, physician, a resident, during a heart procedure. And he noticed that a tube was loose in a, a machine that would have jeopardized, jeopardized the patient. So what he did was he got in between the patient or the resident, shoved him aside, and fixed the jeopardy that this patient was in. He, put the, he replaced the tube. And this incident was reported to the Board of Medicine. So in 2013, the Board of Medicine offered Dr. Calcaterra a settlement agreement. This settlement agreement would have effectively ended his career, uh, so he denied it. So in response, on March 13, 2013, the Iowa Board of Medicine issued a statement of charges which included not only information about that incident in 2010, but it included information that they had gathered through the licensing process that went back a decade. In essence, the board took its entire file that it had on Dr. Calcaterra and dumped it out for public consumption. This was the plain and short statement that the board claims it made. Settlement uh, procedures went on. And then, it was in December of, uh, of 2013 that the Board of Medicine decided to amend their statement of charges. So not only did you have all this exi existing investigative information in the file going back a decade, they found more material. No, uh, by the way, there was no additional charges made. Same charge, they just added more investigative information. This amendment state, amended statement of charges can be found in the confidential appendix at page 15 through 18. Now, this is a four-page statement of charges. Three of the pages are dedicated to seven paragraphs of investigative information, like I said, that go back a decade. Now, after these statement of charges and press releases were published, 
uh, Dr. Calcaterra and his attorney kind of thought the damage has already been done. You know, the allegations themselves are damaging to the physician. This is before they even get a chance to try to defend themselves. And not knowing what the board might publish next, they settled this case on April 19th, 2014. Now the settlement agreement can be found in the confidential appendix at page 23 to two through uh, 26. The settlement agreement itself contains no investigative information. Absolutely none, and despite this fact, that this final decision, because settlements are considered final decisions under agency law, despite this fact, on April 22nd, the board published a third press release, because after each one of these statement of charges, they issue a press release where information goes out. They issued a third one that again included all of this, invest uh, much of this investigative information, not all, but much of the investigative information, even though there was none of this in the settlement agreement. This case represents a violation of due process, the weaponization of agency law, and a clear violation of Iowa Code 272C6-4, which this is the code chapter which regulates licensing boards. As uh, I think you're probably all aware at this point, 272C6-4 uh, explicitly states all complaint files, investigative files, other investigative reports and other investigative information in the possession of a licensing board or peer review committee acting under the authority of a licensing board are privileged and confidential. Now that's a broad statement. And as uh, you know, counsel noted, 272C1 gives the uh, licensee the discretion to even have a hearing in closed session. 272C is designed to keep this information confidential until a final decision has been made by the board and vetted by the members of the Board of Medicine. Council, what do you say about the tension between 272C and 17A sub 12, or point, point 12 sub 2D? There's nothing in 17A uh, 12 that requires it to be public. 17A 12 is to make sure that the licensee is given notice of the action. So is it your view that the complaint is confidential? Um, so, and this kind of goes to the fact what Judge Hansen talked a little bit about. Now, Judge Hansen didn't actually state in the decision that uh, statement of charges, which is a fiction, by the way, a statement of charges doesn't exist in 17A or 7, uh, 272C. The word, the, that term isn't anywhere in there. Judge Hansen said, that uh, he didn't say that statement of charges were public records. He said he could see nothing that forbade, uh, forbid the board from issuing a statement of charges. However, he explicitly said it just, they just can't contain investigative information. That's what Judge Hansen said. Now, counsel also talked about how, you know, these statutes aren't looked at in a vacuum. Um, you know, what do you deal with the, how do you deal with the fact that it seems like for, since time immemorial or for, for a while, longer than I've been on this court, <laughs> the, uh, all these licensing, uh, and, and review agencies, they all have a rule that says their statements of charges are public. And are, are you the first person to complain about this? No, I'm not the, we're not the first person to complain about this. Um, let me address your kind of first question. As far as uh, uh, 272C6 in, in kind of a previous version came about in 1977. So that's 40 years ago, 45 years ago. Close to time I'm <laughs> Right, I know, I'm nearly there. Um, at first, when this, there were quite a few lawsuits and changing the law, and a lot of this background is in the uh, Doe opinion, which we cite in our, uh, it's a 2007 case by this court, which actually says that, which talks about, uh, you know, this case and gives a little bit of a history. So at first, the confidentiality was so 
explicit that it technically didn't even allow agents of the board to see this information. That's kind of what they talk about in the history. And over time, they've added exceptions. They've added exceptions to include uh, if another licensing board in another state wants investigative information, they can give it to another licensing board in another state. There's an exception for the nurse compact, uh, which is a collaboration of nurses so they can go back and forth uh, across states. Also, if the board believes a crime has been committed, there's an exception to release investigative information to a law enforcement agency. But nowhere does 272C uh, give the authority uh, to, to make this information public. Now, I, I don't mean, know I, where... I, it, I oh. agree with you. I think that Doe is a helpful case for you because we, in that case, we trace the legislative history and explain that the, uh, you know, the original statute had such strict confidentiality that there had to be some escape hatches put in so that you could, so that the board could give this information to its own staff. Otherwise, the the process doesn't make sense. So, I and, and then they have this dictum that is consistent with your position that the section assures the general public does not have access to complaint or investigative information unless and until a final decision is published. So that's all supportive, but then you have these rules and regulations that these agencies have been following year, year after year that are contrary to that. So what are we supposed to do? <laughs> well, hopefully you'll forbid these boards from using investigative information in these uh, before a final decision is made. That's what we're asking for. And the justification right. for that. Right. I mean, a statute trumps a, a, a regulation. Um, and hasn't the legislature already done the balancing? That is, how do you protect the public, put them on notice that the doctor may have some, some issues, uh, and they balance it? it? Only the final decision, once charges have been proven and established, is, it all, is, is that public information? And until then, it's confidential. I wouldn't say until charges have been established. I don't think the probable cause hearing, uh, you know, somehow creates a, an exception to confidentiality. It's certainly not in 272C6. And uh, I, Justice uh, Waterman, I was just going to say, statutes trump rule regulations. And that's the, the short answer. Not only that, but 17A uh, specifically says that uh, agencies don't have authority beyond what the legislature has granted them. And of course, that's a fairly established principle. Counsel, yes. is it your position that the statement of charges should not be publicized, or is it just the um, confidential or the investigative information? The statement of charges should not contain any investigative information. That's gathered through. Now, as Justice Hansen points out in his decision, what constitutes uh, confidential information may be uh, a question for another time, but certainly when you look at the statement of charges and press releases that were issued in this case, a vast majority, of, well, I think all kind of the factual statements are investigative information. I do want to speak briefly a little bit about uh, Chapter 22. Now, Chapter 22, which is the Public Records Act, it, it, uh, in Chapter 2, now, first of all, I agree that the, that the confidentiality in 272C exists despite uh, these particular grants of confidentiality in two, uh, Chapter 22.7. But in Chapter 22, uh, 0.76, or 60, I'm sorry, this is an exception, this is, this, uh, provision makes confidential any, quote, information in a record that would permit a government body subject to 21, uh, chapter 21, which is the open meetings law, to hold a closed session. Now, importantly, uh, this information is to remain confidential, quote, until such time as final action is taken on the subject matter of that information. Chapter 22, this particular provision in uh, 227 sub 60, it mirrors the confidentiality in 272 C64. And by the way, the board holds, it pro it holds its probable cause meeting in closed action, session. So this applies to that as well. So there is an exception even within chapter 22 for this. 
Also, 17A is relatively silent on what must be public records, but it does specifically state in 17A3 demands, it only demands that final orders, final orders, decisions and opinions are to be made public for, or made available for public exception, uh, inspection, excuse me. Um, in my reading of 17A, it compels no other documents be made public. So you sort of have this design by the legislature that says this investigative information isn't to be made public until there's a final decision. Now, counsel uh, cited the Reves case, which is an unpublished 2007 opinion by the Court of Appeals. Uh, there's a couple of bases on why the Reves decision is wrong. One, they concluded that the notice required in 17A12 was a public record. They just concluded that. And as, as we kind of spoke earlier, 17A12 does not require public notice. The Reyes case also deferred to the interpretation of the board of 272C6. They said they had the ability to interpret it. Well, this is kind of ridiculous because, A, why would you give a board, if, the, if it's a statute that's intended to uh, limit a board, the licensing boards as a whole, why would you give them the opportunity to interpret it, to expand their own power? And two, uh, 272C64, it, it involves a, a swath of licensing boards. So why would the Board of Medicine be particularly charged with interpreting this statute? Of course, we've already mentioned the Doe case. And, you uh, may wrap up. Oh, <laughs> um, I do want to say, uh, forgive me, uh, the Board of Medicine and all other licensing boards that follow this policy have uh, decided they can basically end a career in the court of public opinion for a contested case or due process is even forwarded, afforded. Uh, this has been done in defiance of Iowa Code 272C and these other statutes I've talked about. And uh, this weaponization of agency process, the processes must be ended now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dixit. Thank you, Judge. May it please the court. I'd like to start off by talking about a statement made here about time immemorial and the practice that has been long standing in the professional licensure boards under 272C. The practice of including limited investigative information has, ex had, has existed with the Board of Medicine for decades. The legislature is aware of this practice and has taken no steps to prevent the inclusion of that limited investigative information. But like my mom used to say, two wrongs don't make a right. Isn't, do, you, uh, do you agree with the um, statement that's been made that the statute will trump rugs, regs and um, rules? Absolutely, Your Honor. We're not arguing that statutes wouldn't trump okay. the administrative rules. We are saying that when taken together with other statutes, not just administrative rules, but other statutes that create this obligation, the longstanding practice that has never been uh, interrupted by the legislature and the interpretation that statutes must be read together, the practice of including very limited investigative information in a statement of charges, which is a public document, is not unreasonable and is actually required. Um, what if, assume that um, from what I, my reading of 17A.12, correct me if I'm wrong, there's nowhere in that statute that says notice has to be public. Do you agree with me? I do, Your Honor. However, as I have stated, it is not the practice of government bodies to assume that things are confidential unless they are made public record. Right, and that's yeah. what 272 is all about, or um, 272C, excuse me. Okay, so um, if, if, the, if it does not have to be public. It, it does have to be public, Your Honor, because there's nothing that carves out notices of hearing as a confidential document. So you think that statute has to say everything that is covered by it? It has to state everything that's confidential instead of a more basic premise in a statute. I mean, you can't seriously think that every situation could be named in a statute to which it covers. Isn't it common sense that it's going to cover a situation, for example, that has to be, according to Chapter 21, subject to a closed meeting? 
It is subject to a closed, chapter 21's carve out for subject to a closed meeting is if the board can elect to hold it enclosed. It is within the power of the licensee, not the government agency to hold a contested case hearing enclosed, which is why again, the board's presumption is that any document that it creates is considered a public record unless explicitly told the line. If you think statement of charges can have some limited informa um, investigative information, how do we draw that line? Absolutely, Your Honor. In sufficient factual allegation to put the licensee and the public on notice about the context of the actual disciplinary charges being filed. We know that the licensee... And, and where do you get that from, is statutorily or regulatory? Well, we know that the licensee has the opportunity to contest how far is too far because that's exactly what happened in Ravis. That's also what happened in a district court case, Doe 2 versus the Iowa Medical Examiners, which um, is also unpublished. But to the extent that it questioned how much information is too much, we know that licensees have the opportunity to contest that. But that is a pleading standard. That can be in any single civil case or criminal case was enough pled to put the but individual on fair notice. Of, I understand the concept of putting the physician on notice, but the idea of putting the public on notice is just an allegation, right? Why are we putting the public on notice? I mean, that isn't... For the same reason that we do in a criminal case, to put the public aware of conduct, although it is... Uh, the contested case has yet to happen, we still include confidential information from minutes of testimony in a criminal complaint. We still include limited information in, say, a petition for a civil case. Just as if we compare so, it to what, what is What is the value to the public of knowing about an allegation of professional misconduct? For example, we don't do that with respect to lawyers and judges, correct? Not initially, Your Honor, but at the, at the time that a statement of charges is filed in front of the Board of Medicine, it can be compared to, say, a grievance commission deciding that public discipline is necessary against a lawyer. Some information is included at that stage. The obligation we owe to the public is that the board's obligation is that for public health, But at safety, that point in the grievance commission, you have a finding after a hearing um, of violations the initial complaint is never made public until a later date. So I guess I'm questioning, what, what is the public's true interest in knowing that a licensee may have been accused of professional misconduct before there's an actual finding of misconduct? I, thank you, Judge. Um, just as with the Grievance Commission is after a finding, the Board of Medicine does make a probable cause determination before publishing a statement of charges. And the interest that the public has is that the Board owes the public an obligation to their health, safety, and welfare. And that cannot be done without providing some basic information as part of a public document. For those reasons, we ask you to reverse. Thank you. Thank you. case of Calcaterra versus Iowa Board of Medicine is hereby submitted.